I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. When something is unfinished, it means it is still in process, being refined, being molded and shaped into something that one day will be final, but is not yet done. We are all unfinished people. We are followers of Jesus, ever striving to look more like him and become more like him. And our journey with him is not yet complete. We as a church have an unfinished story. God has done such incredible things at Christ Church over the last 40 years, and he's not done with us yet. He is truly only just beginning. In 1984, a small group of committed people, along with Pastor Jim Dorman, launched Christ Church of Flagstaff to focus on people who were not connecting to Jesus through other churches. Within the first year, through prayer and fasting, it was determined by those early leaders that our church would focus on helping one another follow Jesus, introducing people in Northern Arizona to Him, helping them take their next steps, and to follow God's heart and commands to help the whole world know Him. Those same guiding principles are still with us today. Through the years, our church has taken many significant steps of faith. In 1991, we merged with First Christian Church, which allowed us to not only have a building space to meet in, but more importantly, we were able to join together multi-generationally and build a beautiful church family. They chose advancing the gospel over comfort. The eternal perspective of those early members changed thousands of lives. Soon after that, it was determined to build our first buildings here on Solier and to sell the property on Cedar that came with the merger in order to make room and space for even more new believers, more of our ones who were coming to know Jesus. This new building was totally packed the first Sunday it opened and it continued to be so until an expansion was built. Throughout our history, God fills the space we provide with people who need Him. It wasn't long after that season that God put on our prayer team and our leaders' hearts that He would ask CCOF sometime in the future to be the church home for 25% of our community. As Jim described that vision to me over the years, it was an incredible shift in perspective. From that point on, we were no longer just establishing and maintaining the church but we were put on mission to partner with God to expand his territory into the most unlikely of places and situations. Matthew 5.14 says, you are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. When we moved here, our church is really important to us because those people become our family. And we knew that we wanted a place for our kids to get plugged in, a place for us to find community. It's just been really special to make it our home. Our kids have all been baptized here. Just seeing them grow from, you know, throughout the ministries all the way up through and graduate high school. Our experience at CCOF has been what God designed for the body of Christ. But well, we have seen Christ bring amazing life change in the last 40 years. We still have over 80,000 neighbors in this region who aren't connected to him through us or another church family. So we're going into a season of our church we're calling Unfinished. Unfinished, first and foremost, is a discipleship initiative. Our primary aim is that every person at Christ Church would engage with God and truly declare His church, His people, and His mission first in our lives. We desire to discover new things about how Jesus calls us to live and give and allow ourselves to be changed and challenged to respond. Our secondary goal is mission advancement, that God would continue on to completion the work he's doing in and through Christ Church. Our unfinished secondary goal has three components. First are our people. What we do day in and day out is often referred to as our general fund budget but it's anything but general. Through Unfinished, we seek to expand our investment in our ongoing ministries and, and trust God to accelerate the transformation He is already doing among us. 
It's just the theme for all of us. I'm unfinished. You're unfinished. God has so much to do through us, with us, to us, as He's um, creating us to be more and more in His image, for this community to be changed, for people to feel loved and seen and heard and to know about um, God and His love and His plan for their life. That is exciting to me. Second is our unfinished church. One of the most critical needs our church faces is more space to connect with our ones when they attend an event or a Sunday service. An additional investment through Unfinished will provide 6,000 square feet of new space to connect with each other and our ones. Imagine where I'm standing right now being a, a, a place for us to connect. This project is the next step to fully developing the property that God has provided CCOF for the purpose of connecting one in four people in Northern Arizona to Him. I think the Unfinished Vision is so much about having a space where we can bring people that haven't been to church before. And I know that's so much of our mission and that's what the Who Is Your One is about, is who can we invite into this. And the space that we're talking about building is all about creating somewhere that's inviting to everybody. And somewhere that feels inviting not just when you walk in, but also stay with us after, which I think is huge. Our third component of Unfinished is our Unfinished Mission. Since 1984, our church has sacrificed so that others could hear the good news of Jesus. And in 2019, we took a big risk and purchased this building adjacent to NAU, which now impacts hundreds of students every week during a season in life in which so many young adults stop following Him. And since 1986, we've partnered with Ibero-American Ministries to take the good news to the Muslim world. An investment through Unfinished will allow us to pay off the corner property mortgage and fund special projects for our international partners' efforts for years to come. So join me in this season, church. Join me in embracing sacrificial, transformational generosity that declares that we are unfinished disciples of Jesus. Join me in moving God's mission forward through Christ Church as we embark upon this next season as a church, let us truly declare that we are unfinished. You're like, what in the world? I, hate I showed Chrissy this year. She's like, this is massive. And I go, there's so many important things. I want to show you a couple things. And here's what I know I just did. And you might have done this. Like you've been to a meeting at your work or your school or something. And somebody hands something to you and says, don't read this. Listen to what I'm about to say. And it never works. And I, I'm just, you know, it's not going to work now either. But so let me show you a couple things that are in your guide here. Because there's so many resources. Obviously, at the beginning, there's an index. You can find your way through it. Put your name on it because they all look alike. But turn to page 20, would you? Like, let's all turn to page 20 together. This is the beginning of the description of our vision. What you just heard me talk about in the video, you're going to be able to find that online if, if you want to, but you want to read it. It's right here in your hands. And on the next several pages, it just describes what God is calling us to do. Now, now turn over to page, uh, what is it, 40. If page 40 has the important dates. These are the things that are coming up. And I want to point out just uh, October 6th that every Sunday between now and including October 6th, we're going to look at God's word. We're going to look at specifically 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And on that Sunday, the 6th, is when we're going to bring our commitment. So you have a commitment card that's attached to the pin that's there. On the page before this, there's a, a, a reprint of the commitment card. These are just tools, so I just want you to make note of that date, and you can be here. Now, one more spot. Turn a couple more pages, page 42. If you're in a life group, I, I saw a bunch of my life group uh, for Monday, and the one we're on on Wednesday, they're all here. And, and this week, take this book, this guide, to your life group, because the study, the lessons that we're doing are all here. And so bring this back also on Sundays. And one more thing. Turn to page 45, and then... We're going to jump into the scripture. Page 45, are you there? You have a pen, right? You have an unfinished pen, which I don't know if that means it just never, you're never done writing. I don't know what that means. That's a funny name for a pen. 
Uh, but we want you to take notes. And, and so this is where our sermon is, we're going to jump into this. Because this is an important season for us. Because there's always something. Have you ever noticed that, that we start things? Have you ever started something you go, man, I didn't realize how hard that was going to be to finish. Maybe you started a project or maybe, you know, you know, a diet or an exercise routine or a goal. I mean, I, I can't relate to any of those. But, right, like uh, a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, we wanted, I wanted to do something cool with, with my daughter. And someone said, hey, do a project together. So I bought her, my, my wife and I bought her a, a ukulele kit for Christmas. It's obviously not finished. Right? Like two and a half years ago, we glued these two pieces together right here. And we glued the, the fretboard to the neck and the neck to the, to the base. And we let it dry. And we let it dry too long because it came apart. We didn't finish it. All the pieces are here. The hardware, the strings, the instructions. There's even a little tiny screwdriver stuck in the box. Like, it's all here. But it strangely was much harder to finish than we ever thought it would be. And I don't, I don't know how long I hold on to this. She doesn't even live at home anymore. We're not going to do it together. But, but life's, it gets like that sometimes, isn't it? And that's why for the next five weeks, we're, we're going to take this title, we're going to take this idea, and we're going to look at God's word under this title of unfinished. Because you and I, we are all, unfinished people. I, I, I think back to, I think of it this way. Do you, you have life insurance? Maybe you do. Maybe, it doesn't matter. Don't raise your hand. Just think about it. Like I, uh, I found this policy status update that I get every, I got every year for a long time from State Farm because in 2002, I bought a life insurance policy because our family was growing and you know, it's like that's, you're supposed to do that. Especially when you have young kids. And, and so the way this worked, just in case you're unfamiliar with how life insurance works, I gave State Farm $48 a month, every month, and they guaranteed that if I were to die in the 20 years this policy was in effect, that my wife or my kids would receive $300,000. That's, that's how insurance works, Right? Maybe you, you have similar policies in place. And, and for me, that was great peace of mind that if something unexpected were to happen, everything would be covered. And, and, and I think for some of us, there's this tendency or there's this, there's this temptation to look at our relationship with Jesus a little bit like life insurance. To ensure that if this heaven and hell thing is true, and, and many of us believe it is, and some of us are just like, well, I don't know, just in case. It sounds pretty bad if I'm wrong. Maybe I'll just buy a policy. Maybe I'll just get the coverage. I'll just do what needs to be done. But what if, what if there's actually more to this following Jesus, Amen. being a Christian, being a part of his family, his church. What if there was something more? You see, life insurance is intended to insure something in the future. That's the point of it. My relationship with God, please hear me. It definitely insures something in the future for all of eternity. I'm not saying anything other than that. But it also unlike life insurance, impacts today. It's not just about the future. Following Jesus is about my purpose. It allows us to grow and find peace. God puts us in his family. It impacts our relationships. And, and for some of us, if we realize, maybe it has been a little bit about the end. And we, we, we focus about the future, the eternity part, unfinished is our opportunity to experience Jesus in a real and new way, to experience him today. Paul was a, was a persecutor of Christians. He, he was somebody who hated the idea of Jesus and Jesus' people, but then one day he met Jesus face to face, 
You, you can read the story in the New Testament, and, and he starts going to places and telling people about the Jesus he met. And then we find in the Bible letters that he wrote to those people and to those churches, and one of them, he wrote to a group of people in the city of Philippi, people he had told about Jesus, people who bought the insurance policy. And he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel, the good news of Jesus. That's what the gospel is from the first day until now. Paul's just saying, you have been following Jesus. You've been a part of this church, this family, this new covenant with God. And I'm so grateful. And then he says this in verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul says to these believers and to us, through God's word, you're unfinished people. God didn't just call you and, 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 and give us this opportunity. There's something in us to finish. It's not just about tomorrow. It's about today. What is it he needs to finish in you? In me, is it our worry and our anxiety that life is just wearing us out? It's beating us down. Is it to grow in our faith, in our love of other people, in our ability to trust him, our willingness to obey and follow him? We are all unfinished people, every single one of us. You will never regret Letting God, who began his good work in you, carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus, until eternity begins for each of us. We're also friends in unfinished church. During unfinished, this next six weeks, we're going to look simply at God's word. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 is where I'm going to teach from, from this point forward. And, and, and so you can read it, you can like see what's coming because this same apostle, Paul, uh, went to Corinth. He was there for 18 months. He established a church, a group of believers. And then he began to have letters write, written back and forth. They would ask questions. They had issues. He'd send them answers. And they're in, our, they're in our Bibles. And this is the second letter we have. Because these chapters are so relevant today to how God wants us, Christ Church of Flagstaff, I believe, to grow as a church family the church in Corinth was being challenged to grow in their faith. Their dependence on God, he's challenged them directly in these words we're going to read in the Bible to grow in trusting God with their resources. In fact, he's so adamant that they grow, he challenges them first with the example of another group of churches to spur them on. He says this at the beginning of chapter 8. Now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Macedonia is just an area of the Roman Empire. Towns like Berea, Thessalonica. It, 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 it's just a group. It, it would be like a state. He says, the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a severe trial. Look at these words. They don't actually work together. They're overwhelming joy. And their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. I mean, just put those words together. Joy, poverty, generosity. Like, that doesn't even make sense to our minds. But that's the church that Paul says, look, these folks, they get it. And, and I want to say, take a second. He says that, that about the grace God has given the Macedonian churches. Grace. When you hear that word, what do you think? It, it means the most literal translation is, is just like favor, definition. It, it's getting what I don't deserve. It's unmerited gift. It's somebody giving you something freely. You can never earn. You can never purchase. Some of us think of grace and we just think of it similar to maybe salvation. Like grace is just this description of the of the life insurance policy we have. And, and that's not, I'm not saying that's wrong, it's just we gotta open our minds to what 
what, what is God saying? How is Paul using this word? Because he's saying that the grace God had given the Macedonian churches allows them to have joy and generosity in the middle of extreme poverty. The churches in Macedonia had a horrible challenge in front of them. Their economic situation was bad. Compared to the time and the life in the church in Corinth, the, these are the two ends of the spectrum in the Roman Empire in the ancient world. Corinth was the place you wanted to live. Corinth was full of tourists every weekend, showing up, spending their money. Well, I mean sailors and people on trade routes. They weren't tourists, but they lived in a destination city. One of the top two or three places in the ancient world you would want to live in the Roman Empire was Corinth. Nobody grew up said, I want to move to Macedonia someday. That's like where all the backwoods people of the world lived in towns like Berea, Thessalonica. People were struggling. And not only that, just struggling in general. The Christians were under intense persecution in, Thess in those cities, in Thessalonica and the, in, in the other areas. They, they still, in the midst of that, decided to participate in Paul's special offering for the believers in Jerusalem. What's happening is in Jerusalem, those who are following Jesus are, are having a hard time even having food to eat, clothes to wear. They're in such poverty. They're, they're losing their jobs, their families. Persecution is intense in Jerusalem. So Paul is going to all the churches in what is today Greece and Turkey to gather money, to go back to Jerusalem, Give it to the leaders of the church there to help those in need. In the church in Macedonia, he says, they're participating. In the late 1990s, I was a youth pastor at a church in Tucson, and we were connected to some ministry work in the city of Kherson, Ukraine. And I got to go to Kherson uh, several different times in that, in that season. And I was incredibly blown away by the stories and the conversations as I got to know believers and people and hear firsthand from those who'd been following Jesus during the Soviet regime in that city, then during a time of, of persecution, a time of lacking freedoms. And, and, and during the very first visit I had, I stood in a, in a church building that was just a few years old. It was, it was so new. Because it was built very soon after the breakup of the Soviet Union and the religious freedom had come to the people of Ukraine. And as I stood in that building, I got to talk to believers who, who sold the gold fillings in their teeth, their families, jewelry, their, their, any possession they had of value. They scraped together the necessary funds to build a place so that the residents of Kherson would know where they could gather, where they could find community, where they could hear about the love of Jesus because for decades, they had lived in, in, in fear. They, they, they would gather as a church in secret locations. They, they knew they were being spied on by the KGB and that people who were seen with, in their gatherings would lose their jobs, their kids would lose chances at education. But they said... They needed a space to connect their community to Jesus, and they held nothing back. I found it incredibly humbling to stand in a building that I considered truly sacred space. Those believers in that church in just a few short years had already launched four other new churches in other parts of this city of nearly a million people so that everywhere you went, you could find a place to connect with Jesus and his family. They started a Bible college to train pastors and they were already sending out missionaries to unengaged people nearby. Today, sadly, their city and many of these sacred spaces have been destroyed in the new season of war and terror. Terror, Kherson was one of the first cities the Russian army invaded in Ukraine. But their faith, their Loyalty to Jesus is still standing strong. No church, no group of believers, which is what we are as a church. We're just a group of people who follow Jesus is ever finished. 
And friends, Christ Church of Flagstaff, we are a church like the churches in Corinth, in Macedonia, in Hearsong. We are being called to sacrifice for the sake of others because we have an unfinished mission as well. What God's called us to do is not done. Look what he, he continues. He says, look at the example of the Macedonian churches. For I testify that they, the, the churches in Macedonia, gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urged, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. What an interesting dichotomy to how it is when we talk about money at church today. Everybody's like, please talk about something else. Anything, let's talk about whatever. Pick a topic, not this one. And these believers were urgently pleading for the privilege to give in this offering. He says they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. Now, underline that phrase in your mind. We're going to come back to it. And then, by the will of God, also to us, so we urged Titus, he's just one of Paul's associates, one of his other workers. He said, he, we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace. Grace on your part. He, he, he's saying, Titus, you, you know, you guys started something. It, it, it's unfinished. Let's finish it. I'm going to send Titus to help finish this act of grace. You heard me say, and if you look at page 20 in your guide, you'll see it there, that our primary goal during this season of Unfinished is 100% engagement of our church family, which is simply that you and I would give ourselves, that statement I asked you to underline in your mind, they gave themselves first to the Lord. That's it. That's the goal is that our church family, if this is your church home, our goal is that you would give yourself to the Lord, that, that like the believers in Macedonia, you would go to God and say, God, what do you want me to do? And, and if this isn't your church home and you're like, I'm trying to figure this Jesus thing out or maybe this is going to be my church, maybe not, what a great time to join in and just say, God, what do you want me to do? What kind of people are these people? What kind of place is this place? In these next two chapters that we're going to spend several weeks on, the word grace is used 10 times. We've already encountered it twice. It's translated in our English Bibles a couple different ways just based on context. But this, this teaching Paul has for the Corinth believers and for us is a teaching about grace. Remember, I asked, what, is, what does that make you think of? It, it's favor. Grace is a gift freely given. And, and if you're still thinking of grace, you might be, you might not be, as, as your insurance policy for the end of your life, and that everything now kind of just accumulates and gets thrown under grace later, like, you can think of grace as simply dealing with the future. But what Paul is challenging this church, and I think us, is to see grace in the present, to see grace from God's perspective it is indeed God's unconditional benevolence that allows my eternity to be with him. That is grace. And Paul makes it clear, though, that when the believers, when the followers of Jesus are generous towards others, it is evidence that God's unfinished mission of grace is working in them and through them. I want, I want you to hear, I want to say that again. When you and I are generous toward others, Paul says it is clear evidence that God's unfinished mission of grace, the work continues of grace. It's working in us. It's working on us and through us. So what does it mean? That, what do you mean by generous? How are, how are we to be generous? Generous in what? And some of us, you, you might be thinking, well, can I be generous in my time? Yes, of course. God has given you time. He asks us to be generous with it, to, to give it to others. In our relationships, 
being forgiving, extending grace to others, encouraging others, yes, for sure, that's a place of generosity. How about with the resources God has asked us to steward? Are we being generous with God's money? God's investments, God's savings, God's items of value that you have? Sometimes we think they're ours, they're God's. Of course he wants us to be generous there as well. And I don't know about you, it's probably just me, but I often try to think about like, well, I've been generous with my time, so I don't have to be generous. I, I, I mean, I could be generous with my time or my, 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 my talents or what I pay attention to or my relationships or my resources or God's resources, and I get to pick one. And, and maybe I'll be generous with my, I'll give money to something I don't want to spend time on. That's sometimes easier, right? Or I'll, I'll volunteer, but I don't have to give because I volunteered. Chris, I've been, how do you think of it? That's how I think of it sometimes. Well, when you look at God's word, when you look at scripture, that's not how he lays it out. We're instructed to be generous with everything. We don't get to pick and choose, and one doesn't get us off the hook of the other. It, it, it's part of what we have to come to, to realize. And what, and what I want us to focus on in, in, in this first next step is to realize grace is the true source and inspiration of generosity. Unfinished is taking the free grace that I've received from Jesus, that you've received from Jesus, and making it accessible for as many people as possible. Grace. The generosity of my time, of the resources I'm asked to manage, of my relationships, of my talents, of my interests. Not obligation. Not, not even obedience. Uh, I mean, obedience in these areas is, is great. I'm not saying disobedience is better, but, but, but using grace, understanding that God's freely given favor to you. His extension of what you don't deserve and saying, how do I freely give what others don't deserve? Because that's been given to me. What good has God done for you? What good has being connected to God done in your life? Can you, can you articulate it? Can you think about it? What good has God done in your life? And who do you know that needs that same good in their life? Grace. Can be our true source and inspiration for generosity. I think all the other sources don't actually lead to generosity. Look, look at what he says next to these believers and to you and I. Since you excel in everything, and in Christ Church, this is us. There are so many great things happening among us in baptisms and, and what's happening in our, our kids' ministry, students, and uh, the the corner and, and people finding Jesus and bringing their friends and sharing spiritual conversations. There's so much good. That's our faith, our speech, our knowledge, our earnestness and love. The Paul reminds them. He, he kindled. He started the fire that's, that's burning bright. See to it that you also excel in the grace of giving. This is just the opportunity we have and the place we need to grow, to let God grow and change us because grace is unfinished in each of us. What if Paul, the apostle, St. Paul, speaking from the ancient past to people living in a city very similar to ours is being used by God to challenge our hearts? What does it look like? What would it look like for you to excel, as he says, in the grace of giving? Christy, my wife, and I, we're, we're wrestling with this very question in our life, in our, in our finances. Over the last several months, we knew this was coming. I mean, there's been so many times where we've talked about something in, in, in just our life and our situation, like, well, you know, with, with unfinished coming, we got to 
And that's just been part of the conversation. We're, we're wrestling with this. I don't know what it looks like for you. But I have found that, that things like this commitment card that was in the packet you just got, the, the information that's in that guide, I have found that these are just, they're tools to help answer the question, what does it look like to excel in the grace of giving? The opportunity, the, the, the free gift, the favor of giving is what he's saying. And, and that's what this, this card, if you want to take it out and look at it for a second, it's, it's also printed on page 30, 80, your guide. We've just let it be a tool to let God challenge us, which you can do as well. One of the most compelling things that I've looked at this commitment card now for, for quite some time, and the story that it tells me is when you look at the back and you look at this chart, there's a lot of numbers. You kind of got to figure out what it's saying. And what I realized is it tells me that every single person has a part to play financially and unfinished. And I mean, you look at the bottom, even the, the, the bottom line, if everyone God is asking to contribute around $100 a month decides not to, then we're going to be, you see, $350,000 short of our total goal. And that's, that's a lot of money. But also those God is entrusted with more of his resources if, if that's us and we decide to not be engaged, we'll be equally short of what we need to accomplish the goal God has put in front of us. See, this guide, this card, our times in our, in our life groups, our times here on Sundays, which I hope you'll be here every single Sunday, these are just tools utilized to let God change us. How does he want us to grow you and I are being invited by the Lord himself into unfinished a time of growth and of stretching. You might be thinking, well, this is just about money and, and, and I'm not good with churches and money. Like, that's a problem for me, so I'm out. Yeah, and you can think that. But what would happen? What would happen if you trusted God to grow you through the money he's entrusted to you. It's his. He, he's just asking us to trust him so he can grow us through that resource he's given. This is not the season to assume. You don't have to be closed-minded. What if we were humble? We listen to the voice of God. If you're a follower of Jesus, then his Holy Spirit lives in your heart. And all I ask you to do this week, your homework, is to ask the question, God, what do you want to do in me so that you can do something through me? I want you to just take some time. This week you have, you have all kinds of information, your, your life group. If, if, and if you're not in one, you're going to hear in a moment how you can join one for just the next six weeks. And as you spend time with the Lord, ask him, what do you want me to do? What do you want to do in me? How do you want me to change? How do you want me to excel in the grace of giving, Lord Jesus? You and I have been given grace. It's unquestioned. We, we have. What are you going to do with that Grace. And, and, and don't be fooled into thinking grace is ever finished. It isn't. And so we go to God in prayer saying, God, take the grace you've given us. Change us how you want so that we can share it with others. Pray with me, God, we thank you that what we cannot earn or what we cannot pay back has been freely given. And as you are calling us to share that broadly, with our community to impact them for you. God, we thank you for the good, good grace that you pour out in our lives. Help us continue pouring it out to those around us who need you, Jesus. Wow, we're really kicking off Unfinished with a Bang. We're so glad that you all are here this morning with us as we start this. 
If you are new, we have a spot in the lobby that says New Start Here. We'd love for you to stop by there and let us know who you are, how you found us, and let us know, um, yeah, just your experience this morning. We have some awesome volunteers there to talk to you. Also, as always, the best place to know what's going on in our church is on the app. There's a lot of really good stuff in here, but there's even more stuff on the app. So if you want to stay up to date on all the events going on, the app is the place. As Chris said several times, we are doing a life group study that is in this book. And if you are not in a life group but would like to join one um, just for the course of the study so that you can engage with other people around this topic and conversation, go ahead and um, uh, do either one of these uh, QR codes actually and then follow the prompts and that will connect you with us and we'll get you plugged into a life group this week so you can walk through this study with other people really engage with this content together. So I'll give you a second if you need to just go ahead and QR that sucker. Also, you can just do the same thing on the app as always. There's a website for Unfinished. So if you, um, we're gonna ask you to bring this book every single week to church. Um, so there's study notes and stuff and we'll be referring to it, but also to your life group. The life group study is in it. If you lose it, Good news is, on this unfinished website, you can download a digital copy. So that is a lot harder to lose, at least for me. So keep a hold of this one, but also there's a website with all this information, and there's a digital copy of this book right on it, along with a whole bunch of other stuff. So that's a good resource for you guys. We've been talking about this prayer walk for a few weeks now. It is coming up on Saturday, and in, again... Guys, this book, it's got everything. In this book, on page 62, you will see information about the Neighborhood Prayer Walk. And um, we're asking everybody to just, on this Saturday, whenever you want to, walk around your neighborhood and pray. The goal is that we cover our community in prayer because the whole goal of Unfinished is to make space to connect more people with Jesus. And part of how we do that is through prayer. So we're going to ask you sometime on Saturday, if you want to get together with other people from our church, if you want to do it yourself, whatever works for you, walk around your neighborhood where you live. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your community. Um, wear one of these bracelets. We have them at the back as you leave um, so that if other people are walking in praying, they'll see your bracelet. You'll see theirs, and you'll be like, yeah, that's right. That's the goal of this bracelet. So grab one of these, walk around the neighborhood, pray on Saturday. We'll be asking for some stories of how that went for you, so look out for that. Um, on the other page, on this same page 62, look at that, page 63, there's a fasting guide. We are asking everybody in the church um, to consider fasting with us on September 24th, which is, again, on this sheet in your guide. It's all in there. And if you do, um, we would invite you to break the fast with us at the Advance Commitment Night. So September 24, 6 to 8, you don't have to fast to come. We're just inviting everybody to do that with us. But we're having a night you're going to want to be ready to lead out with your commitment through this unfinished season. So come on September 24th, 6 to 8 p.m. There's going to be just good time of worship, connection with each other, connection with God. Make space. Um, to hear from God and respond with a commitment. And also, we will be breaking the fast together. So if you fasted, if you didn't, come for the commitment, stay for the food. It's going to be a good time to connect with each other. Put that on your calendar. Again, it's also in your book along with a fasting guide of how to fast together. Last thing. In the lobby, as you walked in today, you probably saw a bunch of t-shirts in boxes. You can get one of these t-shirts for free for yourself today as you walk out at the Unfinished Hub. The area where the t-shirts are is um, our Unfinished Hub. There's lots of good, um, uh, there's t-shirts, there's bracelets, there's stickers, but there's also people to answer any questions you have to keep engaging with this Unfinished thing. There, it's a, it's the hub to find out everything that you want to know about Unfinished as well. You guys, these t-shirts are really soft. You're going you're gonna to want one. Um, they're all there. So please stop, grab a t-shirt, connect with somebody. That hub is going to be staffed for the next five weeks. So any questions that you have, head there. There's going to be pictures. There are pictures on the wall of the renderings. It's got a You Are Here sticker, which is really helpful for me to know where I am in the picture of what we're building. So that's all right there. Please stop by. 
Okay. So the last thing we are going to do every week, we have a question so that we can just engage with each other, get to know people that we didn't come with. So I'm going to have you stand up right now and turn around to somebody you did not come with. And this is very important. What are you more excited about? Pumpkin spice or football? There is one correct answer. Go. Go. 